Welcome to UT Today. I'm Elizabeth Longmire. And I'm Tala Shatara. Coming up today, a close up with the University of Tennessee Chancellor and a recap on the university's year. Plus, Title IX data was released a few weeks ago. What the data says about sexual assault on campus. But first, you may have noticed the large white poles all around UT's campus, either on your way to class or on your walk to Neyland. But just what are these blue lights doing for the people on campus? We have reporter Allison Woodall in studio with more. Thanks, ladies. With the recent safety concerns on campus regarding security, the UTPD is always looking into ways to make our school safer. I took a look at the blue emergency lights and what they're doing to make our students feel safe. There are about 147 blue emergency lights standing in and around the University of Tennessee's campus, but many students and faculty are admitting to forgetting that they exist. They've been around campus for about 30 years. Uh, 10 years ago, they actually added the, uh, the new phones, updated the phone systems, or 15 years, they updated the phone systems, and then the last uh, 10 years, they actually put in the, uh, the speaker phones, the PA systems that are a part of them now. He said that the blue lights are also used to broadcast messages across campus in case of events such as a lockdown or even an emergency storm alert. Uh, there's just a, a push button that if they actually just hit the button, that will actually uh, connect them to 911. And then 911 will actually uh, direct, you know, emergency personnel if that's what's needed or something to them. The blue emergency lights are fairly easy to operate, but what are they doing to make the students feel safe on campus? One of my biggest concerns is my girls' safety and They've said that they haven't had to use them per se, but it's comfortable for them if they're walking home late at night that they know it's there for them if they need it. I think maybe more reminders would be helpful because I think maybe people forget that they're there sometimes. While many students admitted to never seeing one in action, almost all of them can agree that they feel that the lights serve an important role on campus. I know that their presence definitely does make me feel safer as a student. There's always going to be a need for something like this because, you know, you never know. They may not be used every day, but the day that they get used is really important. And Lieutenant Richardson did say that the blue lights get tested about once a quarter to ensure that they'll work when they're needed. Ladies, back to you. An industry we all depend on but never really think about is making strides to help their employees. Truckers across the country are gaining access to easy and affordable health care that they desperately need. UT Today reporter Alana Osborne has the story. Life behind the wheel. Oh, this is a freedom, the open road. Sometimes leaves health care in the back seat. Hundreds of drivers roll through Knoxville every day. Many breaking at truck stops like these. And, you know, we eat, sleep, and breathe there. A lifestyle of fast food and long days, experts say, leave half of truckers with diseases like diabetes and high cholesterol. Oh, man, it, it makes you very, very lazy. Uh, I will say that. Most are left without health insurance. They'll look in their wallet first to see if they're sick. They'll go, nope, I'm not sick today. And those that do carry deductibles of up to $10,000. They don't necessarily carry the best insurance because they're trying to maximize profit. That's why a visit to the doc isn't always easy. This urgent care travel clinic looks to overcome that problem with convenience. We have over 100 truck parking spots here to make it very convenient for a driver to not only fuel and take care of their personal needs, but also take care of their medical needs. They also offer a network program for a flat yearly rate with no copay or deductible, helping truckers care for problems <laughs> so any trucker can go in for services as many times they need in a year. In Knoxville, Ulana Osborne reporting. Although they, although they are concentrated along the I-40 corridor, these clinics are expected to pop up all across America within the coming years. A family in Knoxville is trying to adapt to a new normal in their life after learning this past year that their daughter has a rare disease. Reporter Kayla Grainer has more. As white as a normal two-year-old. Except for one thing, Maris was diagnosed in November 2017 with a rare disease called Alexander disease. Her central nervous system essentially is being attacked by itself. Um, the myelin sheath, which is, which is a sheath around your nerves, um, is deteriorating. 
yeah, over time. Only one out of 100 children have this illness. The disease is not curable, but by staying active, Maris can slow down the progression. With Alexander's disease, you want to keep moving. We want to keep her active and really just keep working her so that she maintains her current skills. The family started a Facebook page called Moving with Maris to spread awareness for Alexander disease. They are also selling t-shirts to raise money to find a cure. The family says the name of the Facebook page comes right from Maris. What fits her? What fits Maris? And so started thinking about the disease and that, that goes back to the moving part and keeping her moving, but th the biggest thing is just keeping up with her and and really moving forward. The White family has been through a lot of changes in the past year, but they say that their goal is to be able to give Maris the best life that they can and to take advantage of each and every day. We spend a lot of time just loving on her, and of course that's we still do that a lot, but um, just like Quinn saying, a little bit more purposeful. For UT Today, I'm Kayla Grainer. The family says that they are planning on taking Maris to Disney World in the near future. If you would like to learn more about Maris's journey and Alexander disease, you can go to their Facebook page called Moving with Maris, Our Journey with Alexander Disease. It's easy to take for granted simple things like getting to and from class in a timely, safe manner. UT Today reporter Ashley Sharp uncovers accessibility issues on campus and how they affect students with disabilities. Student, SGA senator, and lover of musicals. <laughs> These are all things that describe senior Elizabeth Hamilton, who also happens to have a visual impairment. Being a student with a disability results in some daily problems getting to and from class. UT, like a lot of universities, it still has its issues. You know, some of the buildings that were built before the 1991 Americans with Disabilities Act do not fall into code. About 11% of students at the University of Tennessee have a disability, and each individual person faces access issues that the majority of students may overlook. We want to be like everyone else on this campus, but at the same time, you know, we do have different challenges that they don't have. Some of these challenges include a lack of hand railings, automatic doors to buildings, and braille in doorways. But no one experience is the same. Every different disability means a different obstacle to overcome. For Nathan Odom, getting to class can be a bumpy process. One way to resolve these issues is offered by the Office of Disability Services right here in Dunford Hall. It's as simple as filling out a campus accessibility form offered on their website, describing the problem, and submitting it right from your laptop or iPhone. We do ask our students if they do meet with a challenge here on campus is to notify us. Anna Zed Houston is the director for the Office of Disability <coughs> Services and has worked to make areas like the Torchbearer and the Rock completely accessible and continues to hear student concerns. The office also said their biggest goal moving forward is to make every building on campus more accessible. When we return, UT Today reporter Ansley Daniels sits down with the Chancellor Bab Davenport. How she is reflecting on her first year on Rocky Top. I'm just used to saying Chancellor Davenport. Yeah, I hate my life. It's fine. It's fine, guys. <laughs> Start a story. Adopt at the shelterpetproject.org. It's been a little over a year since Beverly Davenport was announced as the first female chancellor at the University of Tennessee. 
UT Today reporter Ansley Daniel caught up with her to talk about her first year in Big Orange Country. Chancellor Davenport, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come be on UT Today with us. You're so welcome. I'm just delighted to be here. Well, as we all know, you've been here for a little over a year now. Let's kind of talk about that. Tell me how you feel. It's been a big year, hasn't it? It's been a great year. We've had some challenges this year. Some days it feels like several years, and some days it feels like I came just a month or so ago. We've had a lot of accomplishments this year, and I hope that uh, some of those challenges haven't overshadowed the great things that have happened this year. Hopefully we can talk about those. So tell me what you have learned to love about the University of Tennessee. You all. <laughs> students. I tell people all the time, my best days are when I'm with students. This is a, an amazing institution and uh, that we are better than some people know. And uh, oh, I think Tennessee knows how great we are. And I want the nation and the world to know how great we are. Title IX recently mm -hmm. came out. That's mm -hmm. been a big thing here on campus lately. Sexual misconduct, the reports are up. Tell us how you feel about that. Title IX is something we have to work at all the time. You might have seen the report that came out this year and some people say, look at those numbers. Those numbers are up, they're way up. That's success to me because if somebody is sexually assaulted and they don't know where to go and they don't report it, we can't help. And if we don't raise awareness, then how will we ever uh, prevent it? You are the first female champion chancellor of the University of Tennessee. Tell me about that experience. I don't wake up every day and think, wow, I'm a woman and I'm doing this job. Uh, but I'm really proud. I'm really, really proud. I, I tell people it's, it's a huge responsibility to have this job, but it's an enormous privilege. And um, if young women like you look at this and think, uh, because I am doing it, that you could do it too. Um, Wow, what, what a great honor that is. My final question for you is what do you hope for the students of the University of Tennessee? That you found um, a way to make a difference in this world and that you, and I think you are, are going to, and that you stand out and that people know that you are volunteers and that you have made this world just a little bit better everywhere you go. Well, Chancellor Davenport, thank you so much for your time and dedication to this university and for coming and staying with us today. Thanks to guys, back to you at the desk. You can visit uttodaytv.com for the full interview with Chancellor Davenport. Earlier this month, UT Today reporter Savannah Jacoby was able to sit down in studio with the candidates running in the Student Government Association elections. She has asked questions about their policy and goals and just how they plan to connect with the Knoxville community. Here's her recap. That's right. Now, the Student Government Association works hand in hand with the administration, whether that be from diversity inclusion issues or even laying down a sidewalk. Now, this year, each campaign is wanting to spice things up a little bit, not just focusing on the UT community, but the Knoxville community as well. The Jack Avery Blaine campaign, the Imagine campaign and the Together campaign are wanting to shake things up for all the students. One campaign is advocating for water refill stations located all throughout Neyland Stadium during the new renovation. You know, the millions of dollars that are going into renovations right now in Neyland, I think it's very feasible to install the infrastructure that would allow for students and fans alike to, you know, get their water and, and kind of take care of that health concern that all of us have faced. Another is looking to work directly with Knoxville to promote more Knoxville community events and attractions on campus. I know that Mayor Rojero is a very passionate leader um, and is always looking for ways to partner with the city. Um, if we took, if we look at the uh, Pace Bike program that they've started, we've got several bike spots on campus. That's just one other way that the city is partnering with our campus to increase that sense of community. Finally, one campaign is pushing to make the university's alcohol policy a damp campus to benefit not just students, but everyone. Tennesseans and citizens all across Tennessee be able to drink here on certain game days and events. So our four-part plan starts with this. We expand it first to Thompson Bowling Arena. We try it there, see how that works. Then we expand it to the Goliath that is Newland Stadium. So much bigger venue, but we're trying there. We see how that works, scale back if we need to, but then move forward with administration, our third part, where we expand to PG Island as well as Circle Park. Now, whether you'll be able to refill your water bottle in Newland Stadium or bring your favorite alcoholic beverage on a campus anytime soon might not be this year, but that's not stopping the campaigns from working on their initiatives. For now, you might just have to down your water before you enter the gate. For UT Today, this is Savannah Jacoby. Back to you. 
The Imagine UT campaign won the SGA election, but all the candidates hope to see their work and all their policy initiatives come through. For the first time in over a decade, the University of Tennessee system launched a new way to engage students and alumni. I learned about the campaign aiming to connect the UT community across the state. Across the state of Tennessee, a resounding message is being heard. Everywhere you look, UT. It brings a lot of pride. The official multimedia campaign recently launched in early March to highlight the statewide contributions of the University of Tennessee system. We've been trying to figure out for a couple of years, how do we tell the collective impact story of the University of Tennessee system? Associate Vice President for Communications and Marketing for the UT system, Tiffany Carpenter, says that this campaign stems from personal experiences. They go out and tell the great stories going on on their campus or throughout the UT system so that other people understand it's not just who won on a football game on Saturday, but that there are really great things coming from the University of Tennessee. Campaign support hoping to raise awareness for the six UT institutions across the state. People don't understand that we're more than just college campuses, that we, we actually go out into the community and we try to help people find solutions, whether it be through research or whether it be through trying to help them fix a problem that maybe they have. UT student body president Morgan Hartgrove agreeing that the campaign brings a sense of Tennessee pride across all parts of the state. As a soon to be alum, I think it's going to be great, um, you know, to be able to, you know, fly into the airports and see, you know, the, everywhere you look UT signs. I was driving um, to Memphis a few weeks ago and I saw, you know, a billboard, um, you know, everywhere you look UT and I can't wait to see more messages like that across the state. Phase two of the campaign launch is expected to go live by the end of 2018. Coming up, a long-standing matchup is revived. Which two Tennessee teams are meeting up for the first time in six years? And learn about an Olympic sport practiced right here in Knoxville when we return. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. Wish that I was on a rocky top. Mariah Rock is in studio today with your sports update. Mariah? Thanks, guys. We're watching, near, near, we're near the completion of the Title IX offices first school year at UT. Reporter Hannah Milby sat down with the offices coordinator to see how they're affecting campus. Oh, on UT's campus, there's an office hoping to right past wrongs. In 2016, eight students filed a lawsuit against UT claiming the school created a hostile sexual environment, specifically in the athletic department and by football players. The lawsuit led to a $2.5 million settlement and two still open investigations by the Department of Education. In response, UT created the Title IX office to ensure investigations are being carried out appropriately. So our goal is to address the issue, investigate the issue, and adjudicate the issue. And and in the most timely way possible. So I think those are all things that we've done well, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity as we move forward. Due to the association of athletics with the lawsuit, active involvement with members of the athletic department is needed. Signs have been recently posted in athletic offices. In addition, this year's Hike the Hill in Heels saw the athletic director, Philip Fulmer, support. I think it's everyone's um, responsibility and obligation, and so I think uh, Philip Fulmer coming out is a, is a testament to that. 
Not only do all members of UT have a responsibility to increase awareness, but UT as an institution has one to assist other schools across the state. Our goal as a flagship institution is to support our state and to ensure that other state schools have access to the resources and the opportunities that we've gotten. For UT Today, Hannah Milby. In their first year, the office has seen an increase in the number of reports. Meeting students are more willing to come forward and more resolutions are being reached. When you think of sports in Tennessee, what do you think of? Football, basketball, or even golf? But there's one sport in town you might not know about, and UT Today reporter Jake Albright was able to try it out. When you enter the Knoxville Ice Chalet, history of ice skating lines the walls. But there's one sport you don't expect to see. The sights and sounds of curling making their way right here to Knoxville. It's because there's a lot of strategy that goes on. Cindy Cordovine has had her go around in the sport of curling. First women's team, two Olympic trials, played in three women's national championships. But now that she's retired from the sport competitively, she holds true to her passion by keeping the sport alive. Is that easy? You don't have to lift it? Right here in town. What curling's always been me feel real good about it. It's something I could do that was something I, I like to do. She says the sport of curling is relatively simple. The skip calls the shots and the sweepers sweep to make it here. From the standpoint of the ease of the sport, anybody can do it. Well, mostly everyone. Yeah. <laughs> but even if you're good, or not so good. Do I still have my Olympic opportunity? Am I close? Cordovine says it's a sport to bring everyone together. It's a sport that actually, once you get into it, um, it's very addictive. Like I said, the social interaction, there's no other, no other outlet for that type of thing. The Tennessee-Memphis basketball rivalry is officially back on. UT Today sports reporter Camille Gear has more on the team's long-standing tradition. Tennessee coach Rick Barnes confirmed on March 26th that the Tennessee Memphis basketball rivalry is officially back on. The state of Tennessee's two flagship public universities will renew their matchup on the basketball court for the first time in six years. The Vols will travel to face the Tigers at the FedEx Forum on December 15th. And in 2019, the Memphis Tigers will travel to Thompson Bowling Arena. The three-year contract will conclude with a neutral meeting site in December of 2020 at Nashville's Bridgestone Arena. Here's what Coach Barnes had to say about the matchup. Not just us, but bring in other teams within the state and just make it a, a day to really promote basketball. That's the reason we're going there that third year. And uh, it won't. And I would imagine if it goes the way we want it to, it won't just be a us playing that day when we go to Nashville. It'll be, uh, again, like to have it some kind of jamboree or extravagant. This rivalry is best remembered for their iconic 2008 matchup when number two Tennessee defeated number one Memphis to achieve Tennessee's first ever number one ranking in men's basketball. That game was the most watched college basketball game in ESPN history with over 5.28 million viewers. For UT Today, I'm Camille Gear reporting. Now, the Vols and the Tigers haven't played each other since 2012 when Memphis defeated Tennessee 85-80 to in Knoxville. So it'll be interesting to see how this matchup plays out. Coming up, a local Knoxville bakery has a lot of love. I take you into the kitchen of one of Knoxville's local treasures up next. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it.
Wish that I was on a rocky top. A North Knoxville bakery has been named one of the top bakeries here in the United States. Wild Love Bakery has been open for two years now. I got the inside scoop on what makes them so wild. Wild Love Bakery has some of the best sandwiches, pastries, and coffee in town here in Knoxville. I spoke with Meg Parrish, who is behind this great new Knoxville hotspot, to see where her idea for starting a bakehouse came from. I'm Meg Parrish. I'm co-owner of Wild Love Bakehouse, and I'm also the head of pastry as well. Meg says that the name is merely a symbol of the bakery's atmosphere and food. Yeah, it just um, wild love, just a passion for what we do. Mm -hmm. She says she wants her bakery to be a place of hospitality when people come in to when they leave. I want them to feel welcome and happy when they come in. It's full of light and it's just nice and bright, so I just want people to feel good and happy when they come in. The location was perfect for Meg and her husband because it is a special place they like to call home. Um, my husband and I first got married. We actually lived across the street, down the street. Um, our first rental house was just down the way. Um, so we've been a part of this neighborhood for a really long time. And so we've always really loved this neighborhood and this part of town. And we just saw the, again, other local businesses starting to come this way and it's just a great community of people, the people that live here and the people that work here. Sean and I couldn't do Old City Java or Wild Love Bakehouse without the help of just an immensely talented team. So we're just so grateful for them. Meg and her husband have officially opened Pearl on Union, a new coffee and pastry shop on Union Avenue. It opened earlier this month. Now I gotta say, when I went there, they were so good to me. The pastries and the coffee was amazing. But I haven't tried Pearl and Avenue, so I have to go. That's my new spot. That's something we need to try. Always looking for a good pastry shop here in Knoxville, especially since it's been booming. What did you have at the coffee shop? I had a sandwich. Awesome. Well, coming up next week, join us for our final episode of the season as we look at what the Lady Balls will end up wear in the WNBA draft and a look into organic healing remedies, how they could be better for you than over-the-counter remedies. Thanks for watching. I'm Elizabeth Longmire. And I'm Tala Shatara.